Um, I want to want to ask a little bit about um, before politics. My uh, your life before politics. Uh, say fresh out of high school. What was what was kind of like that like? Fresh out of high school, I was covered in dirt and sleeping in the wilderness. I was in the infantry <laughs> in the Marine Corps. So, oh wow! Dude. Yeah, after high school, I was I went straight there. Did you yeah. sign up at seven. You what, yeah. went there seventeen? Yeah. Uh, no, I graduated. So okay. I was but yeah, that's 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 what right after high school was. Wow. <laughs> Hurry up and leave. Getting yelled at a lot, and uh, you know, taking an oath early on to defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. You seem to really take your oath seriously. As a person should. You know, you really have to. I mean, if you're going to take an oath, uh, it is, it's important to mean it, you know. And I, I read a book when I was uh, seven. I, I read a lot of books when I was in elementary school. And I read a book called Valley Forge. And it's actually a novel. It's probably about that thick. And it talks about the winter you know, the George Washington's army had before they were able to cross the Delaware River. And it's brutal. I mean, those guys went without food, without shoes. And this is in, you know, northeast winter. You know, it's not like being in Arizona where I am and, you know, if you're outside and it's 50 degrees, like, oh, it's so cold. No, this is sub-zero temperatures. This is, you know, the, the battle for survival. And they went into that with 25,000 uh, members of the Revolutionary Army, and they came out with 2,500. So they gave up a lot. And, and I remember reading that and saying, these guys gave so much. This is amazing. And I started reading all these biographies and all these autobiographies about them, all the presidents I could get my hands on. And especially, you know, the first 30 or 40 years, those people really did some amazing things to get us in a situation where we have a government that should be for the people, by the people, of the people. Like a government more protecting of our rights and, and liberties versus kind of what we have today? The Constitution is there to restrain the government. It's the people's duty to restrain the government. I'm running for city council in Tempe. And I feel like the government in Tempe needs a little restraining. That's a tough job. That's a tough <laughs> job. Well, let me ask you then, uh, what inspired you to run for city council? Uh, you know, there's a, there's a quote that I like, and it says, in order to change government, you have to become government. And in order to prevent what I would see as a potentially violent revolution, I will work in the political process to prevent that. I think we need a revolution of ideas. You know, we, we need an enlightenment. You have a kind of, the way I think about it, the first revolutionary war was driven by the second renaissance. They had a printing press. They had Thomas Paine, Common Sense. They had Benjamin Franklin, Poor Richard Almanacs. They had these ideas that were being spread around the populace and really taking root. We have the same thing with the internet. We have the ability to communicate instantly with anybody around the world, in essence, as long as it's an open, unrestrained internet, which I think is important to keep. So we need the revolution of ideas. You know, if, if our time is spent focusing on Monday Night Football and dancing with the stars and who's got the cutest puppy, then that's what the choice is, and they're not going to really understand what's going on, be involved in what's going on, or taking part in your governance. And it's important, especially in a democracy, to have an informed citizenry, which is why we have a representative republic based on democratic ideals. It's a little bit of difference. We're not we're supposed to be a straight democracy. Primaries, they're new, right? An easy, an easy way for me to kind of lay this out in an analogy Look at how many people vote in a presidential election. 60% maybe, right? When you get down to a city election, it's 
less than 20%. Now, doesn't it make more sense if you really care about your day-to-day -day life and your family and your friends, if you really want to be involved in choosing the path of governance, wouldn't you want to vote in your most basic local elections for more than the national, or at least on par? Down the line, from presidential to governor to county to city, there's a reduction in turnout. And, you know... And these are the guys making decisions with our lives, because we live right. in this city. Tempe has the most influence on my life. You know, they can give me a ticket for crossing the street without the little white guy on the... Uh, you know, the, the sign, if the red hand's there, I can't cross. They can give me a ticket for sitting down on the sidewalk in Tempe. They can give me a ticket for riding a skateboard the wrong way on the sidewalk in Tempe. I mean, there's a lot of things they can do. They can, if they want, they can make my life hell. Right? They can say, well, your house, you know, isn't is up to code. We need this done. We need this done. We need this done. And that stuff happens. You know, it's, the, it's the, you know, our state, our state instance. These kind of things happen across the country. When you see people having their front yard gardens ripped out because the city says you can't have non-grass material in your front yard. That is the ultimate level of control right there. That isn't freedom. It's not freedom at all. When the city of Tempe right now has $4,200 of debt per citizen, of, of per resident, for bond debt, that's, that's not And free. then they won't let us grow tomatoes in our front yard? And te well, Tempe has, the, the Tempe allows chickens. Tempe allows gardens. I mean, they're they're actually pretty but, moderate in a lot of ways. But some cities have already chosen to take them out. Where no, you can't grow your own food in your front yard. With, wow. Yeah, and that that's and that's not okay. Food freedom is very important. It's one of the platforms on my site, freetempe.com. It's important to be able to have that level of control in your own life. But you know, Jason, the the, the question is, if these people are so concerned, why aren't they voting in these local elections? And my answer would be. That's why we have a representative republic. Because the founders knew that not everybody can spend two, three, four hours a day studying politics. It's a full-time job. For me to keep up on what's going on in Tempe, it's a full-time job. For you to and your listeners and, and you know, watchers to keep up on what's going on even with the Senate, with the health care, the Affordable Health Care Act, that's a job. You know, you want to read 2,300 pages? That's just, only one aspect of a one federal aspect. thing. And you're going, to, you're going to take some time out of your life to do it. So I think that's why we're not a true democracy in the sense that most people think of it. We're a representative republic because all you really got to do is know who your precinct committeeman is in your city, in your, in your neighborhood. Do good, elect them, and hold them to the fire, you know? That, that, I think that's how they structured it. I think it was very much on purpose. And I appreciate that they put that forethought into it. And just going back to the original question, what inspired me, their enlightened state of mind when they wrote the Constitution is what inspired me. So you want to you want to inject these logical ideas into city council? Absolutely. This is what this is what most affects me. Right. I, I'm just one guy, I don't have the IRS and FBI knocking on my door, right? They're not saying, you know, Matt, you need to do this, but I get letters from the city of Tempe telling me this needs to happen, or we're going to charge you this much more for your property tax rate because we voted on it. I get those letters. So this is what needs to happen across the country, in Tucson, wherever you guys are watching this from, you have to get involved. This is the mechanism that people can restore the Republic. In Pine, uh, Pine Top, Arizona, within a two-year period, they completely flipped the council. It went from a very status, the, t the town manager, a population of 4,000 was making $100,000 a year plus bonus. They fired the town manager. They put liberty people, constitutional mind, constitutionally minded people in the seats. And guess what? They're not messing with their residents anymore. It's a nice place to live. And is there, there's always pros and cons to stuff in the situation up in Pine Top. Is it, do you see any blatant cons in that, in the no, change? Not no. at all. It's People like their freedom. People, I don't think anybody I've ever spoken with 
has said I don't want to be free. <laughs> well, that's a true statement, definitely, definitely. Um, let me ask, uh, is this your first uh, experience in uh, civic community or government organization? Um, I mean, kind of. I'm currently third vice chair for District 26 Republicans, so we work there. Uh, I've worked with Arizona Liberty Coordinators, which is a group of what you call community leaders that work to further liberty within the Republican Party in Arizona. Uh, you know, I guess if you want to go there, I'm, I'm vice president for my HOA. When I, when I became involved, we had a forty thousand dollar deficit. What is HOA? Homeowners Association. Okay. Currently, we had about a fifty thousand dollar surplus. Uh, you know, we've done we've enhanced security. Uh, we've cleaned up just wasteful expenses. I mean, there's a lot of little minute things, but it, all it takes is going through and looking at the details and taking the time and actually caring about the residents in this case and saying, well, what can we do to make their life easier? Like, can we actually lower their dues? And I think we're getting to the point where, yeah, we can pretty much lower their dues sooner than later. So you're going to apply this, 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 what you have done to the city council and try to do the same thing? All it is is compassion and common sense, man. I mean, it's not rocket science. Well, and it, it sounds like you've uh, contributed to the Republican Party quite a bit. Um, third vice chair, is that the fundraising chair? My job right now, I oversee training. I okay. did uh, media previously, but we just restructured. I'm not now training. You're like PC training and such? Whatever kind of training there is. We got an economic forum coming up on October 8th, I think. We're going to have a Keynesian economist, economist and an Austrian economist. And they're going to talk about what the two different schools of thought are. You are going to you're going to provide a forum for both sides. It's not just going to be a one-sided economy. Oh. So you're going to let people have the freedom to to make up their own mind what they agree with. It's all about freedom. That's great. That's great. So give me a general rundown of your Republican uh, political philosophy. Maybe your top three general concerns that uh, motivate you, you know, the kind of motivation that you wake up and you just, it's its organic motivation. I don't like unnecessary suffering. I think the, uh, the devaluation of our currency causes massive suffering. And you know, we just, we're at a place and you know, the drink that we ordered two years ago was three dollars and today it's five dollars. Again, it doesn't take rocket science to figure this out. It's compassion and common sense. So that's really what, what keeps me going. So fundamental principles, you got to have a strong currency. So when you say um, the devaluation of our currency, are you, are you talking about inflation? Sure, that, that's one way to look at it, yeah. The dollar today is worth much less than it was 100 years ago, easily. I mean, <laughs> probably... 200-fold. Do you, do you see like um, the inflation being a steadily, you know, rising inflation or is it doing more of a snowball effect where the further we get the more it, it raises up? Absolutely raises up. I, I can't go to a restaurant now and, and I, I, within every six months they change their menu. They got, you know, they got the, you guys see this, they, they cross out the price and scribble <laughs> a new price and they're sick of printing new menus. The food costs go up. Absolutely. You know, and, and you realize they don't include food and energy in the consumer price index, which is what they say is inflation. Well, what's your uh, second, second, you know, biggest issue that inspires yeah. you in, in the party? So the second one would be, you know, again, economic. It's economic uh, sustainability. You can't spend more than you make. It just doesn't work. Tempe has spent more than it's made for five or for the last five years. That is not a sustainable solution. It doesn't work. You can't take out more than you put in. It just doesn't, doesn't work that way. And our country is the same way. We have a deficit of $17 trillion. We're going to be talking about raising the debt ceiling again so that we can raise it again next time. No, the buck stops here, man. you got to say no. Sorry. No more. And you want to do that actually in actions and not in just words like we Absolutely. see so often. Yeah, I did it in my own finances. I did it in HOA finances. I don't see any reason why I can't do it for the city of Tempe. Okay. And... Is there a third one that you wake up and think of? It makes me sick 
to think about all the death and destruction that are proactive uh, or our foreign policy foreign policy is wreaking, wreaking havoc upon the world. It makes me physically ill to see veterans come back and realize there's a 600,000 600,000 file backlog in the VA that's going to take at best two and a half years to, to work through. It makes me sick to think that we got people going over there, just like Smedley Butler said, General Smedley Butler, who wrote a book called War is a Racket. It makes me sick that we're serving the interests of corporations. So are... Blood and treasure. Let me just clarify here. Are you, uh, are you saying you're not for defense of the country? Defense is absolutely imperative. That the, the Constitution tasks the government with defending the borders and levying taxes in time of war. It tasks, it actually says to do that. But when they did the uh, change from the Department of War to the Department of Defense, which I think was in 47, things changed because they now it's like, oh, we're, we're defending things. You know, they had this massive military stockpile left over from World War II that President Eisenhower in his farewell address warned us about. And they said, well, we got to do stuff with it, right? I mean, we got this. We got this six million person army right now. We can't just let it go. This is a lot of money. So they turned to the Department of Defense, and now we're defending 1,000 plus military installations in 134 different countries around the world, and we're defending the hell out of them. I am an advocate of George Washington's advice. Be friends and trade with all countries. Do not get involved in foreign entanglements and alliances. Mind your own business. I'm not an isolationist in any means. Don't let anybody tell you I'm an isolationist. I'm not a pacifist at all. I study martial arts. I have several firearms. I'm not concerned about defending my liberty if it needs to be, or somebody I care about, or even an innocent bystander. Well, if I understand you correctly, you're saying defend our country, not everybody else's. Absolutely. You know, why are we worried about the border between Afghanistan and Pakistan who are their own border? It's silly. Defend we don't have our own border worked out perfectly. Not okay. Close. No. So I, I'm a non-interventionist. Okay. And uh, what, do you, what do you perceive, what do you think are the most important things facing Tempe? In the in the real world, what's what yeah. what the real issues are? Economic sustainability. I mean, that's really what it's about. Because if you and I have enough income to do the things we want to do, then we're not going to be so worried about what we don't have. You know, if we can find a way to help the people who are having difficulty now make it through the day a little bit easier, then they're going to be able to do the things they want to do, and that could be improving their life getting more education, focusing on improving the community. So the things that I would do, first and foremost, I would put a resolution forth to the city council to repeal the tax on groceries. It appalls me, it's abhorrent to me, it is a crime against humanity to think that they have a right to tax food. I don't know where they thought they got this right from. I don't know how they sleep at night thinking it's okay to tax food. Because when you do that, you're taxing the very thing that people on fixed incomes, like senior citizens, retired persons, and people on very low incomes, below the poverty line even. It's all they need to get through the day is a freaking thing, something to eat. And you're going to tax that? So first thing Matt Papke does when he's elected to Tempe City Council is he works for a resolution to end the criminal tax on food meant for home consumption in Tempe. The second thing we do look at alternatives. Why is it that Chandler, which is a city not too far from Tempe, a few miles at most, has 244,000 people living in it, has 40% more square miles than Tempe does, yet its solid waste expenses are $8 million less than Tempe, which has a population of 166,000 at most. Why is that? Well, let's look and let's figure it out. Now Chandler did contract that out. They put bid. They said we have a, we have a contract or bid on it. They took a bidder for it. Does it make sense to privatize that? Maybe it does. But I can tell you what doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense to pay more per capita than a city bigger. 
That makes no sense at all. None at all. Tempe has three police stations. Chandler has one. Tempe has a higher crime rate than Chandler, Mesa, Gilbert, Scottsdale. Tempe has a lot of things we really need to look hard at. The average employee in Tempe makes I'm sorry, $102,000 a year total compensation. I don't really think that's in line with the private sector. So let's figure out what they're so valuable for. And if they're so valuable, then why is your crime higher? If they're so valuable, why are we paying more for our, our waste? Why do we pay higher property taxes than any of the East Valley cities? Why is the cost per capita in the city of Tempe magnitudes higher than any of the other cities in the East Valley? Well, it sounds, it sounds like to me um, what you're going to provide to the city council is looking at where people, where cities have done things right and then uh, investigate and maybe apply it to Tempe. Is that, is, am, am I understanding yeah, you correctly? Yeah, what, what, what Tempe likes to do, and a lot of cities do this, so it's not just them. They like to you know pull out a chart and say, Tempe is in the median spending per capita for this thing. When you compare it across Arizona, we're right about here. No, I don't want to be the median. I want to be the best we can be. I want to say, hey, come to Tempe because your taxes are lower. Come to Tempe because we're not going to charge you for tax on your food and for home consumption. Come to Tempe because we got a little crime rate. Come to Tempe because we have a university and we made the the city even better. What, yeah, whatever the draw is, but don't be because you can spend more here. Don't be because we're going to tax you more. It's not a draw. That pushes businesses and people away. That makes people's life difficult. I've been in Tempe. I went to high school in Tempe. I have lived in the same area in Tempe, which is right next to ASU, for probably 10 years now, I'd say. Maybe a little more. And I can tell you, I have seen the homeless climb dramatically. I have seen the level of suffering as far as economic disparity increase by magnitudes. You know, there's people that they wake up and they go stand on the corner. And that's what I, they I, that's what they do all day. And that wasn't like that when I moved here. Do you um, have any ideas or thoughts concerning the homeless here in Tempe? Yeah. I mean, any common sense and compassion. You know, common sense and compassion. It doesn't make sense like some cities have ordinances to not feed the homeless. That, that, that blows my mind. You know, that, that blows my mind, what, too. Seriously, what, what's wrong with these people? Yeah. It doesn't make sense to find people for being homeless because the reason they're homeless is primarily an economic one. So you got to have common sense and compassion. Now, there are definitely people who, for one reason or the other, slip between the cracks, as people say, um, aren't capable of holding down a job. You know, they don't have the mental capacity, they don't have the emotional stability. Or a lot of times, uh, what I've noticed is it has a lot to do with addiction problems. Right. No, they, they, that aren't just going to disappear, you know, by snapping your fingers. Right. So you address it with compassion and common sense. And, you know, you can't, like, snap your fingers and, and fix it. But you can stop by persecuting them. You don't have to make somebody feel bad because they're homeless. And that's kind of that does happen. That does happen. Well, I appreciate you acknowledging the homeless. You know, um, currently, you know, I'm from Tucson, so currently it's illegal to sleep in the park during nighttime hours. It's perfectly legal to pitch a tent during the day and sleep all day. Uh, would you be in support of some kind of, you know, reasonable idea of maybe a, a 24-hour public campground for the homeless, or, or something along those idea, uh, lines, or maybe even a better idea? So, so th th there's not an easy answer, right? When you're asleep, you're your most vulnerable time. I agree. And there are criminals, there are people that will do wrong out there. So I really don't think it is a good idea to say you can come sleep in the park because there's no security in place. Unless you know the homeless people want to develop their own fire watch like we have in the military. You're gonna stay up and I'm gonna sleep, right? I don't I don't think that makes sense. A few different reasons. One, huge liability concern for the city. 
because they're, they're advocating people to use their public property in a way that could lead to significant violence. What if it was, um, you know, use at your own risk kind of thing? Yeah, I don't, I don't think there's a way to really do that. Okay. But I would be very much for having a safe place. And I'm not talking about a place where they have barbed wire pointing in and they have locks and they say you can't leave until sunlight, sunrise. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a place where people can go to feel safe. And I'm completely for that. Uh, I would like to see the city, if we are going to use the general welfare clause in the Constitution, I think that is where it is most readily applied, is to the people who have the true, the true issues. So maybe a private property sort of deal? Private or public. Okay. I wouldn't mind it being a city facility, but there would have to be you know, measures in place that would limit the liability and protect the life and the liberty of, of the people who would take, it, take uh, you know, use of it. Well, that's, that's good. That's good. Um, I happened to notice the uh, Tempe light rail. I stopped in at a place and came by. What do you think of the light rail? I mean, they're popping up all over the country sure. right now, like so I, like in Detroit, um, they're constructing a brand new light rail system for public transportation, and it seems like it, that's almost a spin in the face to some of the people who are really suffering in Detroit right now, more than helping. Yeah, I mean, you can look at it that way. Um, you know, I've used a light rail probably five times in the last three years. Is it fun? I wouldn't call it fun. Okay. No. I like trains. You know, trains <laughs> are cool. Like trains. You know. <laughs> no, it's a good, it's a good way to get from A to B if you're going, you know, pretty much linear. Uh, but the cost of building the infrastructure for the light rail is immense. The city of Tempe has taken on about three hundred million dollars of bond debt since that project. I, and I don't know, I, we will determine how much specifically is for that, <clears throat> but it's a lot. And that's why they keep raising taxes. And all it does is go from east to west in the East Valley. If you want to go from this end of Tempe to the other end, you can do it, right? I don't think they're making any money on it. I'm pretty sure they're losing money on it on an ongoing basis. It's hard to nail the numbers down because they contract with the uh, me uh, Valley Metro on it and, and the transit, Phoenix Transit. So it's very difficult to actually nail down the actual hard cost, and I don't think they want you to know. But I don't think it is better than a bus in any way, shape, or form. A bus has the ability not only to move people, but to move people dynamically. I think when you build a light rail, what you're saying is we're going to build inf we're going to build all the buildings around this now because everybody's going to live here because the light rail is here. And what you kind of have happen is the people that use the light rail are the people that can't afford cars for the most part. And you develop this lower class area for people to live in through affordable housing, which is what they're doing. And at the end of the day, I don't really think it benefits the people. I think it benefits the developers and whoever got the handshake deal from the contract. So a bus, if you're going to do mass transit, I think it's pretty cool because you can go north, you can go south, you can go east, you can go west, you can even do a U-turn if you want in a bus. It might take a while, but you can still do it. And uh, you can upgrade the technology as it goes. We, you know, we have some buses that are carbon, uh, I'm sorry, uh, natural gas. You can even do electric buses if you want. I mean, people are in this mind mentality that the light rail is clean energy. It's not. It either comes from coal-fired or nuclear-powered plants they send the electricity to the lines that the light rail runs on. It's not like it's magically this alternative fuel. It's not. And you, and you were simply talking about the cost to build it. Not even you didn't even address the upkeep involved in it, which I can only imagine it's, is enormous. It's not that much. You know, when you look at the total the transit is one of the biggest expenses in Tempe, and the light rail is about twenty percent of that, from what I can tell so far. Okay. So it's not, it's, you know, it's one of those things you think it's going to be, wow, it's going to be so expensive. 
but once it's there, it's not. But but the cost to build it is immense, and it only benefits the people that are on the line. Right. And Tempe, believe it or not, is more than just ASU. There's a ton of people, probably the more the vast majority of people that live in South Tempe that have never ridden the line. I talk and they're paying for it, the but it doesn't make any sense for them to ride. Pay six hundred thirty-three dollars annually to subsidize Tempe's transit budget for the college, basically. That's definitely one way to look at it. You know, there are these blue buses running all around Tempe. They're called orbits, and they're free. And they shuttle people from here to there. I've seen people get on a bus, ride it for two hundred feet, get off the bus. And they're absolutely free to ride, but they're not free because we pay for it. And that is where a lot of the money in the transit goes. And Tempe has a hearing uh, September 28th to look at even making the buses bigger. Now, who's the biggest benefit, benefactor of this free to the public but not free to the taxpayer transit line? Who? Well, I'm going to guess it's probably ASU. It allows them to move their students from A to B pretty quickly without them having to manage any parking, without having anything. They just get on the, light, the uh, orbit bus and they go from A to B and then they're there. My, but, my layman logic would say that ASU should should subsidize it. I mean, if, if it's only benefiting the citizens primarily that go to ASU. Well, that's you where think? you know compassion and common sense come in. Yeah, you don't want a student not to get to class on time because they couldn't get there. They had, for whatever reason, they don't have a car. But at the same time, does it make sense to charge somebody living eight miles south fifty some dollars a month to make sure they can get to class on time? I don't know the answer. I know the question, and that's a question the voters have to decide on. I notice you've been active in the GMO free foods movement and promoting community gardens. So what, what more can you tell me about this? Well, one of the platforms of the campaign is food freedom. I think people should grow their own food. I think they should have chickens, fresh eggs every day if they want. If they have the, you know, the space to do it. Absolutely. You want to talk about empowering the people. Let them grow their own food. Let them experience and connect with nature and start figuring that out. People talk about how there's a spiritual disconnect in our country. Well, connect with nature. You know, you go camp and you get that good feeling. You know, you're out, out there and you, you breathe the air and you're with birds and there's trees and you're like, this is great, right? But you know, you got to go back to work. So do it in your house. Do it in your backyard. Do it in your front yard. Connect with nature, right? That's a big thing for me. So as far as GMO, um, I am not against science in any way, shape, or form. Not at all, right? My car is based on science, my shoes are based on a lot of science. Uh, I, I work in a tech industry, right? So I, I'm not against science at all. I am vehemently against the collusion of corporations and governments. That's called fascism, by definition, Mussolini. I am against that, and we look at a company like Monsanto, or I call them Monsanto. Uh, they're kind of a poster child for that, right? The head of the FTAA Food Safety is the former legal counsel for Monsanto. The FTAA doesn't regulate GMOs like it does other foods. Um, you look at other countries, Europe has all but banned genetically modified organisms. Asia has pretty much banned it. Much of South America, even countries in Africa, have banned it. Now there's two, all right, there's three reasons I'll say. One, it destroys the small farmer. Let's think for a minute here. We currently have an unemployment rate of 7.3%, right? That's the official unemployment, the, the unemployment rate. Now, the U3 number is probably closer to 15. Well, what if, instead of consolidating all these farming operations into gigantic corporate-owned tens of thousands of acres plot run by machines and people that have to wear 
biohazard gear just to farm the land, what if we had small farmers? What if we had farmers? Tempe used to be a huge agricultural district. What if we had farmers out here? Like neighborhood farmers even? Neighborhood farmers. Why not? They do it in China. This is one of the things they're actually really good at. They build a city, but they build food at the same time. They build food capacity. Grocery stores only care about three days of food. Once that supply chain, chain stops, it stops. Well, I noticed um, in Detroit that they, instead of going through government, what they, what a few neighborhoods have been doing is they go and they knock on the neighbor's door and they say, hey, there's an abandoned lot here. Do you care if I turn it into a garden? And there's, uh, they're trying to help people make a living off of it. Exactly. Common sense and compassion. This is my point. So, genetically, it hurt, genetic modified food, the large corporate structures they build around the production of that product, hurts small farmers. In India, they got farmers committing suicide because they can't pay the bills because they took out loans to buy the GMO seeds that didn't produce what they thought they would, and now they're, they're stuck. We went through this in the 20s in America. We wiped out a lot of small farmers. That was an actual process of foreclosing on their land. That's what we did as a country or as a government, if you want to talk about that way. Secondarily, nobody really knows the health risks here. We really don't know. There's a lot of circumstantial evidence and maybe some things you could say are causal, but we don't know. They're so new that we don't know. So I advocate, and my teacher tells me, if it hasn't been around for 50 years, it's experimental. So let's slow down a little bit. Let's not pump food that is technically full of pesticide injected genetically. The Roundup gene is genetically, or is atomically injected into the GMO crop. Let's just slow down a minute and make sure we're doing the right thing before we start pumping it out in mass. And that's what they're doing. They're not testing it, I'm saying. They're not taking the time. Right. Well, Thirdly, you look at the countries that have banned it. Well, they didn't just ban it because they said, well, this is not a good thing. We're just, we're, we're just going to ban it because we want to ban it. They actually test it. France has done heavy, heavy experimentation on it. Russia's done a lot of experimenting on it. And the results that they come up with far, far different than what the companies, Monsanto, and the organizations that are accredited. So you're saying there's concrete, scientific evidence that, that backs that up? Outside of U.S. Um, interest studies, yeah, and you, you can easily go look at look up. And not even... Study. Not even health benefits, but you got to think, or, or the health risk. Not even considering the health risk, you also got to consider the risk to um, our uh, agriculture. Because what happens is, from what I understand, the the farmers who buy Monsanto seeds, they also turn around and buy Monsanto pesticides that's immune to the seeds. That's right. They spray it for two or three years, leaving this large farmland can no longer grow naturally because gotta, it's been treated with pesticides. They gotta dump a ton of nitrogen on it to make it fertile again. So, just, so the, basically whether, I mean, my perception of it, whether or not people are for community gardens, it's gonna go that way regardless of if we want it or not. It's go, Russia has that. When Stalin took power, there was a lot of people that died. The vast majority died from starvation. The Russians to this day understand that and they have gardens and they're poorest of poorest place. They got they might have a garden this big, but they're growing some turnips and they're gonna feed their family when they need to. So absolutely. I mean it is imperative if you want to be independent to have food freedom and the campaign really focuses on that because it's very important. I wanna empower people at every opportunity I can. And a community garden, great idea. Tempe had one. Just shut it down because they built a hotel on top of it. Oh. But they had one, and that's a good thing. Right? We should focus on some of the good things they do. And I would be all for building more. I had a great talk with the uh, head of conservation for Tempe, and her eyes lit up when I started talking about gardening as a way not only to connect with nature, but to provide for the people and empower the people. So if you got elected for city council, you would do everything in your power to 
maybe have more of a free market situation with food, produce, and gardening? Well, I think there is a free market situation in Tempe. Okay. I mean, I, I don't see any overt government involvement in that other than, like I said, the criminal tax on food that Tempe somehow feels it is justified in exercising. Um, but it's all about community. I mean, it's very really simple. It's common sense and compassion. Right? Obviously, everybody wants people to have food. Well, why don't we just teach them how to grow it? I mean, we're in a desert. I get it. It doesn't rain every day. But I see people washing their cars. I'd much rather see them putting water on a garden if they're going to you know, to do that. There, there are things we can do to say, hey, here's some common sense solutions. Let's work together. And that's just going to be good for everybody involved. Common sense and compassion, and you're and you're running you're running as a Republican, right? I am third vice chair for District 26 Republicans. I'm a precinct committeeman, and I'm a state committeeman. And I was a national delegate in 2012 for Republican National Convention, and I was unseated. I think a lot of people will be happy to hear that you're injecting some common sense and compassion. <laughs> and um, when it, lastly, I wanted to ask. Um, I hear you're throwing an event in Tempe. This sounds really exciting. It's called uh, Freedom Under the Stars? Freedom Under the Stars, brother. Great. Um, what activities do you have planned there? Freedom Under the Stars, brother. <laughs> uh, Jordan Page, uh, an amazing musician, song, you know, songwriter, musician, guitarist. Worked with him several times. He's opened up for many candidates that I support. And he lives in Ohio, I believe. He's agreed to come out here and do a fundraiser for me. Uh, so he's going to play on October 18th at 6.30 p.m. at Monty's on Mill, which is a nice uh, steakhouse. Um, we got the patio. We're going to rope it off, and we're going to have a cool concert. We're limiting it to, it's going to be a small audience. We're limiting it to 100 people. So make sure you get your tickets now. Go to freetempe.com. Uh, click on events and click on the link for Freedom Under the Stars, and then I'll give you a way to purchase your tickets. And it's, it's just going to be fun. I mean, if you're not having fun, you're doing it wrong. And our campaign's been pretty fun so far. We're going to keep doing it. Well, hey, I can't think of a better reason to keep doing it. You know, definitely. And I've seen him live, too. He's an excellent live performer. Amazing. If I can be there, I definitely will. And um, last question. What is your absolute favorite thing concerning the United States Constitution? I only get to pick one, huh? Well, <laughs> if, if you pick what I'm thinking you're going to pick, I'm going to ask you for two. Okay. Well, the, the Constitution, and I'm sure a lot of your uh, viewers have one of these. Um, it's pretty important, by far and away. It's, it's you know, the, the document that has given us the longest lasting uh, government in recent history, uh, 270 years of counting. So I think the biggest, the most important aspect of the Constitution, and not the Bill of Rights, the Constitution, is that it empowers the people. It empowers the people to restrain their government uh, when the Constitution is adhered to. There are so many pitfalls to tyranny within the Constitution, that in order for someone to unwind it, it takes a lot of work, a lot of time, and a lot of evil. So the empowerment of the people is by far and away the most important part to me. Excellent, excellent. Well, I, I definitely hope that uh, you get your truth and your revolutionary ideas out there. Thanks, brother. Thank you, Matt.